This is Conspiranormal, where the nexus of conspiracy theory and the paranormal meet. And now, we join the show already in progress with your hosts, Adam, Seraphiel, and Rob. I guess you're already recording over there. Oh yeah, it's going. All right, cool. Okay. Well, welcome to Gaspar Normal, guys. It's a romper room episode. I think this is number seven. I think. In the history of romper rooms. I think so. Maybe. I may be wrong. <laughs> That's a lucky mystical number. <laughs> yeah, it is a lucky mystical number because we're going to talk about some mysticism tonight. And this is going to be an interesting one, guys, because uh, Serfiel here um, thought of doing a show all about new thought and what it is and some of its roots into some earlier traditions. And we're pulling a lot of our material from a source called The Secret Source, which is a book by Adam Parfrey. And what was the other lady's name? You might. I do not know how to pronounce it. it. It's. I think it's Maja Doust. Okay. Doust. That. Uh, that sounds right. Yeah. Baja Doust. Yeah. Ma, I don't know if it's Maja yeah. or Maha. She's probably listening right now, screaming. At yes, the, we we apologize. So, but uh, so we're gonna talk about this, and we've been uh, coming over here for the last few weeks. We've. Serfiel has all these like old vinyl records from like, what is it? Like the fifties and sixties. Yeah, mostly. And it's all stuff from like guys like Napoleon Hill and Earl Nightingale. And we posted some weird video on Instagram. If anybody follows us on Instagram where Serfiel was playing along to this, uh, one of these, one of these things. And we were trying to get some, uh, Get some uh, good vibes started on uh, from from the New Thought records. So, what is this? What is New Thought? And then also we should add too that that this is something that comes up periodically. So I think the latest iteration of this, the latest incarnation of this, was about what was it ten years ago with a book called The Source, The Secret, The Secret. Thank right. you. Yeah, yeah. And the popular. Uh, television i don't know, know was it a television special or i know he's like uh the author was an uh, was on oprah oprah was like the big yeah propagator of it there was a movie version yeah. too wasn't there like yeah. a movie kind of slash documentary about it yeah and i think well? that's what that's what really reached out to the masses um other than just the book but so i guess just in general new thought really comes out of the mid 19th century it comes from uh, has roots in uh transcendentalism and all these other religious movements that were going on at the time, uh, especially in, I think like, uh, was it new England? And, yeah. Transcendentalist was mostly new England. Like, was it, uh, Emerson? Yeah. And those yeah. guys. Yeah. Um, and I guess kind of this individualistic spirituality, um, that was going on with the transcendentalists. And then of course, all the, you were also having kind of a, a you know, new interest in, for lack of a better term, just Western esoteric tradition and hermeticism and all these things were starting to get in a kind of gumbo pot together. So you had this this movement that was created that came to be known as New Thought, but it was kind of disparate at the time. You had a lot of these different thinkers, faith faith healers, um, different sects of, of Christianity, mesmerism, all kind of eventually combined into this. Okay. So we should start, I think, historically with the first, what they talk about, the first part of the book about mesmerism and what that was. And then we'll kind of take some more of these kind of historical examples and okay. what kind of leads up to new thought. And we're talking about um, the 19th century, we're roughly talking like, like the late, probably like the mid to the late 19th century. 
So and we're talking about stuff like Christian science comes out of this and a lot of um, Norman Vincent Peale, the uh, Christian theologian. The ideas of positive thinking, really the whole ideas of what we call the self-help industry now. Yeah. And, and, we'll, and we'll get to that. But let's, we'll, let's talk about like kind of where this starts, I think, in the 18th century with mesmerism. Right. And what mesmerism was. So Franz Anton Mesmer is a big fan of Newton and is trying to figure out these uh, similar scientific and physics questions that there's an underlying force to all of the universe and uh, living beings that living beings can impact uh, each other with like certain ener- certain types of energy that that is similar to uh, magnetism as it's observed in the in physical phenomenon. In other words, you something can influence its environment, right? Or you yeah. can influence another person, and this is a larger idea that um, your that mental states can create reality. So Wikipedia defines animal magnetism as also known as mesmerism was a name given by German Dr. Franz Mesmer in the 18th century to what he believed to be an invisible natural force possessed by all living things, including humans, animals, and vegetables. He believed that the force could have physical effects, including healing, and he tried persistently, but without success to achieve scientific recognition of his ideas. That's the definition given. So you can influence something and everything influences its environment around it, basically. Right. Or influences others. The first application of of these so-called powers that a mesmerist would uh, be able to manipulate was applied in in healthcare and healing. And no matter how corny all this stuff sounds, these people, like Mesmer literally healed thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. And so you had these mesmerists uh, and faith healers who would do this type of things. And this is also where hypnotism comes from is mesmerism. And out of hypnotism, then then, uh, you get really spiritualism and these whole ideas of contacting the contacting the dead or dictating uh, sacred manuscripts from the, you know, from another dimension or whatever it is, you know, all this comes from the same, the same root really in mesmerism. Okay. So we move from mesmerism, this whole idea that the influence that one can have on something else or influence that an animal or plant or whatever could have on its environment we move from that to these to these other ideas through through mesmer and is it uh, Benaeus Quimby yeah that is kind of where the the starting point of like kind of the transition from mesmerism to this whole like new thought ideas so Benaeus Quimby was a mesmerist um in America his uh he lived from 1802 to 1866 so he was a mesmerist who went around healing people and putting them into hypnotic states to heal them. And I guess through his exploration of putting people into these hypnotic states came to the conclusion, I think that it was more about uh, the power of the mind, his power to influence people and their power when, when under the influence and when, uh, when believing that they were being healed they were actually, they were actually healed. So he starts, he really starts and, and he influences people that he heals and people that see him are really influenced and uh, directly create both what became before uh, new thought was really solidified. What a man named Warren felt Evans called mental science. And then another person, one of his Quimby students was Mary Baker Eddy, who of course creates Christian science. And this is all becomes on the premise of uh, that sickness originates in the mind and with this mental cure and, and faith in it, they can, 
they can heal. Okay. So how successful was he doing this? I mean, I guess he was pretty successful. Here's some things about Phineas Quimby uh, from this book. It was in 1838 that Quimby learned of mesmerism by attending a lecture by Dr. Collier, and he shortly thereafter set about becoming a mesmerist. Quimby went through spurts of success and failure with treating patients for many years until finally he found one individual whom he could influence no matter the situation. This patient was a young boy named Lucius Berkmar. Lucius appeared not only to be prone to Quimby's influence, but to actually possess clairvoyant abilities of his own. Quimby discovered that Lucius could, in fact, diagnose the diseases of others with great accuracy. One day, Lucius offered a diagnosis for Quimby himself, who had been suffering considerable back pain that he had never mentioned to Lucius. Lucius told Quimby that his kidney was detaching, and he proceeded to pass his hands over the area. How can your kidney be detaching? Telling Quimby it was now fixed. Afterwards, Quimby never again felt a pain in this area and was effectively cured. This led Quimby to believe that Lucius was reading his mind and convincing him that his ailment did not exist. So that's some of the example of what Quimby of what Quimby would do and how he got into this whole idea. Through yeah, through one of his hypnotic subjects. Yeah. Who had special powers after being hypnotized. All right, so this feeds into uh, Mary Baker Eddy, who is a kind of a disciple of Quimby, and there were a lot of people that were a disciple of Quimby. Um, she comes up with this thing called Christian Science, and you know, I, I, I've always heard of Christian Science. Yeah, it's always something. You even see the churches. I mean, they got a couple right, here. Right. Right. So, it, this is some information about her. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, born Mary Morse Baker, founded the Church of Christ Scientists in 1879. Her most noteworthy published work was Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and it was subjected to a still ongoing controversy involving Quimby supporters. Eddie was chronically sick with many ailments, including paralysis, hysteria, seizures, and convulsions. At 22, she married her first of three husbands, George Glover, an avid Freemason, who died within six months from yellow fever. This led her to explore types of healing that were outside of the realm of traditional doctors, such as homeopathy and mesmerism. After Glover's death, she became an active mesmerist and evolved herself in the spiritualist community. It was her studies in mesmerism that drew her to the office of Dr. Quimby in 1862. In the beginning of her studies of animal magnetism, Mrs. Eddy hailed its treatments. After Quimby passed away, however, she changed her, tr- she changed her tune regarding this practice. She began to refer to it as malicious animal magnetism, or MAM. She wrote of it in her church manual as mental malpractice, According to Mrs. Eddy, the MAMs would send evil suggestions to her, sickening her. It was said by Quimby supporters that Mary Baker Eddy came into possession of her healer's manuscripts and borrowed their ideas and vilified their author after his death, despite relying on him exclusively for her treatments while he was alive. So this is another way that this stuff is kind of coming into like almost a mainstream Christian, right? In mainstream Christianity. And, uh, there's also this concept in the Christian science that she is, it's almost like the, the idea of like Christ consciousness. Right. That's where they really, it, the Christian part is not about um, what we think of as Christian. The Christian part is about uh, recognizing that, that Jesus had, was in t- both in tune with this universal mind, mental power, and he had these, uh, healing abilities he knew how to do these things that everyone else can and you can obtain this christ consciousness also that will allow you to accomplish the same kind of thing so it's more about jesus as an example of human potential than uh actual faith in jesus as a the savior and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah in other words we could we could harness what jesus had right in other words yeah so that we could be just like just like him, and we could be able to heal people just like him as well. Which, um, when we kind of get into some of the other where it all comes from, it, it'll that'll kind of make sense. Um, okay, so from that that root of mesmerism, Phineas Quimby, we get into kind of like the new thought proper, right? And and then really, and what they really articulate really good in this book, the secret source, is that. Uh, primarily everything was about healing at first. 
this was all like alternative medicine. Uh, but in it, there were kernels of uh, just uh, changing your life, changing yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is in the backdrop of there being plenty of this uh, success literature also. Yeah. And books like how to, how to win friends and influence people and all this kind Dale of Dale Carnegie. And yeah. yeah. And you have these historical forces where all these people are coming from the agricultural backgrounds into the cities, being salesmen, uh, being disconnected from their families and maybe more traditional faiths. So all these people are, are really needing help because everything is like high pressure, totally individualistic, you know, it's, it's, so it requires like a new, uh, a lot of people had a void that that these things filled in the same way that uh, a lot of fraternal organizations did also. But you start having this, so within New Thought, going from healing to uh, helping you out in business and life and applying these principles of using your mental powers in order to get rich. Yeah, yeah. And so you have this idea of the law of attraction uh, that is also a part of, you know, all this he healing stuff we've been talking about. You know, it's about thinking, you know, feel well first, think you're healed, and then you'll be healed. Well, they wanted to start applying this to uh, to materialism as well. And you had a guy, uh, Prentice Mumford, who who wrote a book called Your Forces and Your Mental Forces and How to Use Them. Uh, he had an essay series uh, that... Were, was turned into that book, an essay series through 1866 through 1892. And he really introduced this idea of the law of attraction uh, for success in, in life and business. He had another book called Thoughts Are Things. And uh, Mumford really advanced things further from this, these mental cure ideas to applications in, in other areas of life. Yeah, I love the titles of the books. Oh, yeah. They're just always just like so positive and. <laughs> like you're just going to be able to just thoughts are things just just, just change the world with your thoughts um if you see if, if anyone's ever seen the movie the founder that came out about uh ray cross guy yeah the mcdonald yeah the, the the first mcdonald's franchisee the guy who actually stole the idea he's listening to a lot of these type of self-help yeah. records and tapes yeah in 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 it so this is i mean this is a big thing that even in the 20th century has become even more like explosive. I think with like, just like the rampant rise of kind of like that whole, like capitalism, the idea of the entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, Cause think about it, now we're going through D after deindustrialization and it's a similar kind of shock to a lot of people and people yeah. are having to rely on themselves more and more and come up with a uh, whole, you know, ways that they're going to make livings. They can't rely on just getting a job at the plant anymore. It's kind of a similar environment. Yeah, so that's where you get the seeker come in. And, like, I, th I think Tony Robbins is one of those yeah, guys, Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know? that's the thing. You have, it's, there. there's a, a total, you know, there's a total spectrum from just positive thinking, basic stuff, and then it gets more and more spiritual and occult, you know, on one side. So, uh -huh. you know, you have just like your Zig Ziglar, who's just all this positive stuff, but then he's in conferences with Earl Nightingale, who's kind of like dipping into uh, some of this like pseudo hermetic new thought stuff, and it keeps, you know. Then all the way at the other end, you have people like uh, William Walker Atkinson, who I think really was the one to really bring bring it out that uh, the occult roots of New Thought. Okay. And so in in uh, nineteen oh six he 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 comes out with a book called Thought Vibration and the Law of Attraction in the Thought World. Um, and he is part of a magazine called Modern Thought, which at at the same time there's a, a magazine called Nautilus. There's a New Thought magazine. You have all these associations and Christian science churches, it just really starts taking off. And uh, so he, he writes that book and it's really influential. Like he was the editor of new thought magazine. Uh, and actually before that book, I'm sorry, in 1889, he writes an article called a mental science catechism. That is the, uh, that's really his, his breakthrough into new thought. Uh, he's also, greatly influenced by mesmerism. He's a Mason theosophist and has ties to the golden dawn. Okay. 
So now we're digging a little bit deeper now. Yeah, getting yeah. Into so the weeds then, here. Yeah. So he he also gets into like Eastern mysticism. He says that he he meets this uh, Swami Vivekananda uh, at the World Parliament of Religions at the World's Fair in Chicago. I think it's like um, 1893, I think. Yeah, this is like some of the first Hindu stuff uh, into the United States. And he starts taking some of that stuff, some of this new thought material, and publishing a bunch of different books under different pseudonyms. So he takes the Hindu stuff and he uh, calls himself uh, Yogi Rama Sharaka. Um, he has a uh, another one, uh, Magus Incognito. Um, Theodore Sheldon, Theron Q. DeMont, and Swami Pachandasi. Uh, so he writes about these pseudonyms allow him to uh, write about these different subjects as an expert or a supposed, you know, master. And uh, then he comes out, his, his uh, a publishing interest of his comes out with a book called The Kabbalion. And it's his uh, Yogi uh, Publishing Society. I had never heard about this publishes. until I read this in the book. Never, yeah, never heard of this thing. So it's ever. presented as this, the secret teachings, you know, that are like unearthed by yeah. the written by the three initiates. Three initiates, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, which was likely Atkinson, <laughs> uh, another cultist, Paul Foster Case, who formed the uh, mail order secret society builders of Aditum. And possibly another guy, Michael Whitty or Whitey. I don't know how you say his name. So the Kabbalion is like this uh, cult, you know, masterpiece that takes all all this new thought stuff and shows you how it all comes from from Hermeticism, essentially. Right. And so this kind of brings it brings it all the way back uh, to its to its supposed roots. And kind of uh, and and mystifies new thought and just the ideas of using uh, mystical powers and using the the uh, essence of the universe and the mind of God, whatever you want to call it, to advance in life. Do we want to give just like real brief? Yeah. Let's give real brief the the seven principles, the seven hermetic laws, as stated in the Kabbalion. And these are, one, the principle of mentalism, two, the principle of correspondence, three, the principle of vibration, four, the principle of polarity, five, the principle of rhythm, six, the principle of cause and effect, and seven, the principle of gender. These are the seven hermetic principles upon which the entire hermetic philosophy is based, according to the <laughs> Kabbalion by the three initiates. Yeah. Yeah, so this is... Uh... Now, I've I've heard some occultists recently talk about how uh, it's actually a pretty good book, and it and it's actually really a you know it's really democratizing all this stuff. But the way it's presented is real uh, you know cheesy. Like this is actually this you know ancient ancient book with secrets. Uh, but within it, I mean, it really is. Uh, it's it's pretty authentic though. Yeah. So it, it really represents this real democratization of the hermetic wisdom. And people are super into this today. Yeah, it's still yeah still published over and over again. Um, I think there's been some copyright issues with his interests trying to, uh, you know, keep it only the intellectual property of the Atkinson estate. Um, but yeah, it continues continues to influence people people still pick it up every day and apply it to their lives and i'm sure you know that you can find testimonials everywhere okay so we we go from the kabbalion which borrows all these kind of hermetic ideas and also we should probably add in too i think we may have missed this that uh, there's some um influence from swedenborg emmanuel swedenborg as well Oh, absolutely. That would that would go back into the 19th century and a lot of those uh that alternative Christianity uh and I think he really just blew it open as far as saying I think Swedenborg just gave an example to a lot of people that you can be really far out and still say you're Christian. 
I think more than sure. anything, that's yeah. what his biggest yeah. influence was. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a version of a very very mystic Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff in Swedenborg that I think is reminiscent of, where I think he, he talks about visiting other planets. Okay, as well, it's very kind of like you know alien contactee kind of stuff. It's yeah, it's real yeah. interesting that how you know he's he's apparently. Uh, goes to different planets and um he's one of the considered cons- considered by some people one of the first kind of like they'd almost say like, like he's a contactee or an abductee kind of so so there's there's an interesting tie in there as well i wanted to add too that in the Kabbalion, the the second principle the principle of correspondence um is basically summed out as b- above so below as below so above and that is a huge like occult and hermetic yeah it's from the principle the emerald tablet yeah which is another thing that uh, has an interesting history <laughs> the emerald tablet <laughs> yeah they get into that was that. an interesting chapter <laughs> so yeah not only in this in this book in particular not only do they go into just not only do they just give an exposé of the development of new thought in christian science but they go back to, you know, they say, well, if, if, if Atkinson and some of these other guys say that these ideas are ancient hermetic wisdom, then really what does that mean? And so it also gives a real expose on what hermeticism uh, actually is and uh, alternative timelines for the birth of Christianity and all this kind of stuff. So the, the book's kind of a, it's almost like a two. Uh, it's almost like two books in one, because I think those those parts are, you know, distinct different parts. I think. Yeah, and we'll get into some of like how the um, we're gonna have someone come on and talk a little bit about how the the influence on modern day Christianity with some of this this new thought stuff. But let's let's dig a little deeper into the into the weeds here with um, the the link to Hermeticism and a lot of it. Um, has to run through, I guess, Rosicrucianism as well. Yeah, that too. It seems like, uh, especially with, uh, in America, Amarch, uh, who were, everyone was competing over the same thing. You know, that you had this demand for, for self-improvement in America. And you had these, you had the traditional brick and mortar uh, fraternities, like the Masons, but then you also have these, like all these mail order fraternities springing up. And of course, one of the most influential was Amarch. And it seems like they were kind of in, you have like Think and Grow Rich, all this other stuff really blowing up at the time. And, yeah. And Amarch, I think was, they were kind of like putting out all this stuff, like some of these records I'm looking for where they're, they're kind of trying to sober it up a little bit. And say, you know, you can't just expect everything out of the universe. And, and it was, it's kind of refreshing to like listen to some of that stuff after I've been listening to all this, like, you know, brainwash yourself into success and, you know, you deserve everything. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, you know. yeah. So they, they kind of, they kind of chilled it out a little bit. Um, but it was essentially the same kind of things as far as using, using your mental power and using uh, essentially the power of the cosmos or God in order to uh, advance yourself in life. Okay. Which isn't, I mean, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a bad idea. I don't even think it, you know, it doesn't have to be so excessive, but uh, it's a, I think a lot of people have, People who have used this stuff and been successful, uh, you can't really tell them shit about this stuff not working. Now, just common sense, you probably have to have a pretty positive mental attitude in order to accomplish a lot of things because shit is right. hard to do. Right. And everything does originate in your mind as an idea. Like, I'm sure this podcast was just an idea you had and yeah. you manifested yeah. it. So. You know, there is some, uh, you know, very factual basis to these ideas, you know, at least just the general idea of uh, how important positive thinking is. Well, it it, it tends to, it, it seems to me that this is very much a kind of like, almost a class kind of thing 
I mean, I, I, you know, not, not to get too political here, but you know, because like, you know, I'm the first to really, I'm the last to really say that like, you know, about white privilege and all this kind of stuff. But like, there is a certain amount of point to some of that in where that you almost do have like this, uh, you, you, you are basically born with more of a head start than somebody else and somebody yeah. else that is, you know, they might have a rich family or they got even more of a head start over us, you know, just, so the, it depends on what, I think it depends on what you have to overcome. Right. I mean, if you're like, if you're just in like some like real abject poverty, it's going to take a lot more than just positive thinking to make that happen. Yeah. But in I my mean, opinion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really uniquely American because of all those things you said too. Yeah. And, uh, there's a very, it was like the Horatio Alger kind of, yeah. It's very, uh, that kind of aspect to it as well. But then also, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, if you're, if you're down at the bottom and you, succumb to negative thinking i mean that that can uh it, there's a lot of opportunities to really mess things up really bad really quick you yeah know? so it true it, it's important for everybody but i guess what what you're seeing too is that uh there's no better not to get too political but there's really no no better uh example of how this can go wrong <laughs> than our president right now because he's the product of a Christian Science Church or a positive thinking church. Yeah, yeah, because the church that the and and this is true. I mean, people can look this up. The church that he went to as a child, his parents' church was the church that Norman Vincent Peale uh, spoke at. And Norman Vincent Peale is very much kind of a product of the. He's very much a product of the New Thought movement. This whole the, this whole idea that you know you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can make things happen. You know, th this will happen for you. You could be this rich. You know, you don't have to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Again, going back to the Horatio Alger ideal of capitalism, you know, and, and now people have that same idea, right? Because that's why that that's why that they that they like Trump so much because they'd see that the well, you know, like, you know, we, we could be just like him. Yeah. There's yeah. very much that 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 whole idea of like and there's nothing wrong with it per se. But that whole like American dream idea that we could reach those heights, right? And he could yeah. afford to fail over and over again, right? <laughs> you know, right? Like, yeah. It's, whereas it's, some, it's you not know, a some problem. working class sure. guy, you start his little business and and he gets sued and loses everything. You know, yeah. it's not going to be as easy to get but to it, his next venture. But it's it, yeah, it's 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 just a certain mentality that 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 people have. And yeah, you're right. I the mean, dark Trump, side, Trump yeah. is a is a is a product of new of new thought. I mean, you can take that forever you however you want to take it. You want so, to take it yeah. good or bad, you can take it whatever. But you know, the fact remains, he is, you know, he he heard it in church all day and all day on Sunday and that's what that's 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 how he grew up. And he his he kind of manifests that the whole idea of of new thought through this kind of like strange kind of form of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Um so I guess we were really talking about the, the birth of it and everything. But then what I want to say is I think the, the mid century really uh, with, with uh, audio, video, television, books, the, I mean, that's when it, it really had its pop culture form in uh, think and grow rich and the speaker Earl Nightingale and, and, and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And that was like, I guess that was a kind of the second wave. And then we've had a Paul Harvey, apparently. Oh, absolutely. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, Paul Harvey was even any part of that. It's that magazine that you had, that magazine from like the 1970s. Well, that's what I'm saying. There was this gray uh, from your Paul Harvey's and Zig Ziglar's all the way uh -huh. to the more mystical. You know, it's all in this kind of self, this self-help, the salesman strategies, all this kind of stuff. You know, it was, it was all in the same, that same era, the, um, I think it really influenced uh, the Church of the Subgenius. You can see it, you know, because the whole idea of slacking and then yeah. getting rich from slacking because you're yeah. just in tune with Bob. Church of the Subgenius is like a parody 
parody of religion. all this yeah. kind of stuff. Like, they, they, looking at those pictures of like, you know, in that magazine, you had like each article, you had this like little drawing of Napoleon Hill or Earl Nightingale, right? And uh, looking at those pictures, you're like, okay, that's this is the church, this is where they got Bob from Church of the Sub Genius, <laughs> yeah, totally. which I think was probably something they pulled out of some. Out of something like that, very much like that, the guy I think with the, the advertisement's been found now. Yeah, so. yeah, like where, where they actually pulled it but out. That's so, blasphemy. Don't yeah. speak on Bob like that. <laughs> Praise Bob, Bob Dobbs. <laughs> so, but so we got this this route into Hermeticism. And did we kind of want to briefly explain what Hermeticism is, or? Yeah, you go for it, man. <laughs> I, I'll go for it, man. I'll rely on the book. Of, I'll, I'll rely on the book of knowledge. This is not the Emerald Tablet, by the way. Oh, something I did want to add. The Emerald um, Tablet is in here if we want to. So, something I did. Something I did want to add um, that there is a section in the book, and I don't remember exactly where it is, but they talk about how there's this idea that to really gain enlightenment, you have to be rich. Because all you're going to do is, if you're not rich, if you're poor, all you're going to be doing is just working all the time. You're always going to be trying to meet, make ends meet. You're never going to be able Sounds to. Familiar. You're never going to be able to study all the you know occult or hermetic literature that you want to become truly enlightened. So if you're rich, you've got all that taken care of, and then you can just go ahead and have your free time, and you can study the Emerald Tablet or Kabbalion or whatever the hell it is and you can you can get enlightened you know which is kind of like the opposite in what hermeticism actually kind of teaches yes. well you know what which is almost like this ascet ascetic kind of lifestyle well um, not necessarily but but then but what you're saying the occult scoop on that is you know what, what that really is is that is that's a very hindu yeah. concept and i think that's really where you know that this new thought became this almost dumping grounds for any kind of mystical mumbo jumbo that you could distill into some kind of selfish shit, <laughs> you know, like, so there was plenty of, of things taken from uh, all kinds of traditions in the East and from Hinduism also. So you see a lot of that, but yeah, the guy who wrote uh, the science of getting rich Wallace Waddles, I think his name was nice name. Um, and all this stuff, you know, is really, a lot of it's really pretty common and really ridiculous when you're listening to it nowadays. But it's still real tolerable and positive. But if you try to read or listen to The Science of Getting Rich, I mean, it's, it's just sickening. It sickens me, dude. <laughs> I mean, it's like this. Is it, that's probably oh where I'm pulling God. that from is where I read that. But uh, because they, they do reprint a lot of this stuff yeah, in the yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Secret exactly Horse like book. what you yeah. said. I mean, it's just, it's disgusting, especially as a person, you know, like a regular person who has to bust their ass and you're like, oh. Well, yeah, well, it's this whole idea that you can only be enlightened if you're rich. And this, I mean, that's like, you know, the, this is where the conspiracy theory stuff comes into, right? Because they'll say that, like, well, the, the rich see themselves as enlightened. Well, you know, that, that must be like the, that's the very definition of like the Illuminati, right? The rich elite that uh, is into all this kind of weird shit like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And but occultism. whereas like the... But, I mean, these ideas of, like, the Cavalian, these ideas of mail-order Rosicrucianism, and even the, you know, fratern how popular the fraternal organizations were, was a, that that was cool about that. It was a real democratization of these, this ancient knowledge that was supposed to be only reserved for the rulers, you know? So, even though a lot of it was presented kind of crass and corny, and people might think it's kind of sacrilegious almost, I think a lot of that's positive. You know. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into a little bit about hermeticism here, um, and what it's what it is. Hermeticism, also called hermetism, is a religious, philosophical, and esoteric tradition based primarily upon writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest Hermes. These writings have greatly influenced the Western esoteric tradition and were considered to be of great importance during both the Renaissance and the Reformation. The tradition tr traces its origin to a Prisca Theologia, a doctrine that affirms the existence of a single true theology 
that is present in all religions and that was given by God to man in, in antiquity. Many writers, including Lactantius, Cyprian of Carthage, Augustine of Hippo, Marsilio Ficino, Giovanni Pico della Morandola, Giordano Bruno, Tommaso Campanella, Sir Thomas Brown, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, that goes back to the Transcendentalists, considered Hermes Trismegistus to be a wise pagan prophet who foresaw the coming of Christianity. Much of the importance of Hermeticism rises from its connection with the development of science during the time from 1300 to 1600 AD. The prominence that it gave to the idea of influencing or controlling nature led many scientists to look to magic and its allied arts, e.g. alchemy, astrology, which it was thought could put nature to the test by means of experiments. Consequently, it was the practical aspects of Hermetic writings that attracted the attention of scientists. Isaac Newton placed great faith in the concept of an unadulterated, pure, ancient doctrine, which he studied vigorously to aid his understanding of the physical world. So this whole idea of Hermeticism and what it is, the idea of, comes from books known as the Corpus Hermeticum, were part of a renaissance of syncretistic and intellectualized pagan thought that took place from the 3rd to the 7th century A.D., these post-Christian Greek texts dwell upon the oneness and goodness of God, urge purification of the soul, and defend religious practices such as the veneration of images. Their predominant literary form is the dialogue. Hermes Trismegistus instructs a perplexed disciple upon various teachings of the hidden wisdom. So, a, a symbol of Hermeticism also is like the caduceus, which yes. is very interesting. That uh, ties all this into itself because yeah. it all new thought started with healing. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to back to the idea of mesmerism and what mesmer was trying to do with that, yeah. And hermeticism is extremely interesting. We could do a whole entire show on hermeticism. We we talked a little bit about this with uh, Mark Stavish about what kind of like what hermeticism is. Hermeticism, um, it seemed to me from reading The Secret Source, there's a lot of connection to alchemy as well. But it's almost like this, it, it has this idea of like kind of like a spiritual science, essentially. But these ancient traditions that, I mean, that are handed down from really ancient Egypt and maybe right. even beyond ancient Egypt. But, you know, so the idea, your Hermes... Uh, obviously the, the God in the messenger God in Greek mythology, who is also Mercury in Roman mythology, but is also his equivalent in Egyptian mythology is the God Thoth, who is the God of knowledge, God of wisdom. Thoth is the one that has the head of the Ebus. And, uh, there's a lot, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of interesting, uh, stuff about Thoth and, uh, these, 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 there's also these weird kind of connections to, to, to the book of Enoch, to, um, the, 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 the Nephilim and the watcher angels and all this, this kind of weird, yeah. weird stuff. Well, I mean, it's really just this Alexandrian yeah. synthesis of all, you know, pretty much all of these mystery traditions, all of these mythologies, they all kind of coalesce at this one place. And th that's why it's hard to really understand because it, it's really just this like big amalgamation, but it is founded on basic ideas. And it took me a long time to really get, uh, to get around it because I think just the, the semantics were tripping me up because everything is about the mind of God. And really, I think what the word we use now is consciousness. So the, the basic idea is that the creator is one thing that it's unitary consciousness and there isn't a big separation between uh, the creator and the creation. And as opposed to Gnosticism that was also going around that might be seen to have more of a negative connotation of the physical world. Hermeticism saw a, uh, the physical world as a part of everything uh, of what we are is a manifestation of the divine that is using us to understand the physical world. Uh, so it's very complex, but 
there is a lot of thought that this is kind of the essence of what we call the Western esoteric tradition and that this is kind of this was the hidden religion of Western civilization under a Christendom. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And it also starts to um, kind of really kicks off the age of, of the Renaissance and the age of enlightenment as well. All these, all these different ideas like Isaac Newton was seriously into hermeticism and, and into alchemy. Uh, much more, so people don't really recognize that, but he was. So what's that kind of, what's the influence of all this like hermeticism onto new thought? The new thought, you know, well, is, is it, is it almost yeah. like a direct, is new thought kind of like a, almost a direct child of hermeticism? I think it, it is a, it's like, it's a distillation of it. And a lot of it is an exploitation of it uh, because it's this thing that, that was semi secret and rare. Yeah. Uh, it's like, uh, say there's a, you know, there's like a, a temple from antiquity that someone digs up and all these looters just start, you know, you can sell that column there. You can break off this obelisk and take it to your museum. You can, you know, and I just think people kind of taking up from, from this, tradition and trying to distill it for popular consumption for people's selfish ends. But there's, 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 there's some good in it too, but it can, you know, I don't, I'm not being that judgmental, I guess, but, uh, it probably just sounded like I was like pro profaning of the mysteries. You know? Oh, I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Well, it almost kind of is, I, I, I'm not afraid to say that it really kind of is in a way, because like I mentioned before, the hermeticism almost, it, it almost seems that it was just like this, it, 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 it was a way to live, but it was a way for people that were initiates. And you didn't necessarily have to be this rich guy. You could be anybody yeah. that you wanted to and be. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't aesthetic, but it it was, it wasn't materialistic at the same time. Right, right, exactly. It was more of a spiritual kind of, of, of system. Right. It wasn't this idea that, you know, like you're going to get material wealth out of this. Right. That you could. And there's a section in the back of the secret source. And I think Adam Parfrey wrote this, that he talks about kind of like, be careful what you wish for. Maybe some secret should be, should not be uh, told. Right. Because, you know, like, like you maybe this isn't meant for the masses yeah. because it's misuse. Yeah. Because you, know, you get the power and, you know, this, the idea of just like uh, he, he, he goes into the, the story of the golem, right? From, yeah, yeah. from the, like the Jewish uh, Kabbalistic mythology where, you know, somebody creates a golem because the, the Jewish community in Prague was being uh, persecuted essentially and by the by the anti-semites of the time and he creates the rabbi creates the, the them so he can set the golem so he can kill those guys well the golem makes no distinction between them and everybody else in the jewish community so he goes around killing them too so like all of a sudden the the creation gets away from the creator and he has this whole section about also talking about you know solomon and the goetia and how solomon would you know conjure up these demons and in, in, in the end solomon couldn't even control the demons you know so to speak so uh, uh just uh, to brief mention about uh the three major texts in hermetic doctrines which is the corpus hermeticum that's the most widely known that's a collection of a lot of texts. In the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Tresmegistus. I'll go in a little bit on this. So it is a short work which contains a phrase that is well known in occult circles, as above, so below, which is in the, in the, in the occult, in Hermeticism, and in the Kabbalion, which is a new thought book. <laughs> so this whole, and also I guess that that has something to do a little bit with mesmerism too, in that the influence of the, I guess, spiritual world upon the physical world, essentially. And the ideas of vibration and all sure. that. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so the actual text of that maxim is translated by Dennis, Dennis W. Hawk is, that which is below corresponds to that which is above, and that which is above corresponds to that which is below to accomplish the miracle of the one thing. The Emerald Tablet also refers to the three parts of the wisdom of the whole universe, Hermes states that his knowledge of these three parts is the reason why he received the name Tresmegistus. Thrice great are Eo, 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 which means greatest. As the story is told, the Emerald Tablet was found by Alexander the Great at Hebron, supposedly in the tomb of Hermes. And there's some interesting stuff here that was really cool. 
about the Emerald Tablet, some of these stories, that Alexander the Great finds that in the mummified hands of Hermes. Because <laughs> there's all this stuff about, like, is Hermes a god or was he just a dude or was he a group of dudes? But, you know, Hermes is holding this mummify, you know, in his mummified hands. And uh, Alexander the Great has to rip it out of his hands, right? And then, like, a couple of centuries later, you've got Apollonius of Tiana, who's this almost like, he's like a counterpart of Christ in right. a weird way. And he goes to the tomb of Alexander the Great to rip the emerald tablet out of his mummified hands. It's just like, it's like what's going on? <laughs> it just makes yeah. such a cool, it's like almost like a fifth element kind of, uh, kind of thing. And then there's the perfect sermon, which is known as the Eclep- Asclepius, the perfect discourse or the perfect teaching. So those are the, those are the three different texts. And the Kabbalion is listed there, which also, as we've said, is actually a uh, also a, a later yeah. addition to all this by the three initiates. And some of the people that have said that, uh, that Edward White of the Golden Dawn, who actually came out with the, the White Rider deck, mm-hmm. the, tarot the, deck. the tarot deck. Yeah. So... All these different little connections to all this, all this kind of stuff. But I had no idea. I thought all this new thought stuff was just complete, just self-help bullshit. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) you know, my experience with it was really, um, I remember seeing Think and Grow Rich and other stuff like that being really young, but, um, really just being a vinyl collector and like getting all these weird, you know, Think and Grow Rich records, uh, Brainwash yourself into success records, all kinds of crap. Earl Nightingale. Yeah, you had that one that's like hip, like self hypnotism or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Tell yourself <laughs> you will be a success. But uh, I guess, um, I've just you know then when the secret came out and and like meeting people who are just like really into the shit, uh, it's it's been real interesting and it. it it started, you know, it's crazy because it, it starts as really profane, but then, like, I got into all this other shit separately, you know, all this Western esoteric tradition stuff, uh, weird, you know, this weird spiritual stuff, and then then only later I connect the dots. Like, holy shit, this stuff really does come from this. Yeah. And when I heard that this book was coming out before it actually came out, I was really excited, but then I, I waited a while to actually read it. Cause I got distracted by other stuff, but yeah, man, it's a, this book, I would, I'd really recommend it to get your head, uh, not only around the history of new thought and it's continuing impact to this day, but also it's a great primer on hermeticism itself. Yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk, a, we're going to get, I think we're going to try to get Dr. Future in here. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of the the inf because he's writing his he's writing his magnum opus he's writing his corpus hermeticum right now <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk to him a little bit about some of the the influence on just like modern day Christianity. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to add that we may have missed? No, I was it was I was kind of jumping all over the place. It's a large Long subject. Of a, a time span. This, so trying to trace trace kind of a, a genealogical tree, but, um, you know, I can't mention everybody's for everyone, all the new thought authors and thinkers I left out, you know, for all you guys I left out. Uh, sorry. But. Okay. Well, let's, uh, we'll, we'll call Dr. Future here in just a little bit. We'll get his thoughts on some of this stuff and, uh, guys, we'll be back with him on Kids Paranormal. So we've got, a sponsor called you may have heard of it called ZipRecruiter. No, I've never heard. And of you it. can further it. hypnotize yourself into success. And if you want to help us and help the show and ZipRecruiter, on behalf of our partner ZipRecruiter, here's why ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience, and actively invites them to apply to your job, so you get quality. Qualified candidates fast. Uh, 
It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. Thus, rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. And right now, if you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Conspiranormal, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Conspiranormal. Surfiel is here. What's up, Doc? Oh. Hey, buddy. Uh, um, are we gonna get started? Yeah, let's let's start. Action. Okay. All right. So we got Doctor Future on the line. He's making an appearance on Conspiracy Normal. I think this is like the good uh, evening, viewers. The fi- the the fiftieth time. So the fiftieth. Yeah, I think it's, it's something like that. You counted them. And yeah. it's 50? Yeah. Really? Yeah. But this is that's, a... That's like 400 hours. Yeah, I, I could do... We, 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 I need to do a uh, Dr. Future Mega Mix <laughs> for... Yeah, uh, you all could make a fortune off of it. Yeah, I should do you it. I make should like just... one of those long YouTube videos that people just go to sleep to. I, I may do like that. I night. may do that. That may that'd be a good idea because I could do that and I could have like Walter Bosley... Too right, I could do like the whole like Walter Bosley mega mix, the Doctor <laughs> Future mega mix, you know, the, not a bad idea. Joshua Cutchin mega mix, you know, I could do. Now, uh, is he the guy that was the dad on uh, Happy Days? Uh, I think that was Tom Bosley. What? Oh, okay. No, okay. no, no, no. no, and he's not the guy that came up with the with the uh, with the baldness cure. Okay. Either, okay. So. Yeah, that's another one too. Yeah. Okay. Who's that? I need that. I think you do too, Adam. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 I've got a nice maybe, full head of hair. What are you talking about? Maybe we can use the power of new thought to regrow oh, our hair. Oh, yeah. The nice segue there, man. I can I like it. visualize myself with a full head of hair like I used to have. Yeah. And then it will I'd have to just have to give those thoughts wings, and it'll happen. Like what, what, Red Bull. What would you visualize yourself as, Dr. Future? Me? What would be your goals to vi- to visualize to 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 make happen? Uh, somebody who actually got a book finished and published. Like I that's think, sort of like the impossible dream. I think you're I think you're visualizing that as we speak, right? Well, I'm trying to, but it's a very dystopian vision. Yes, but the reason we got you on, take you away from the writing for just a little bit, is yeah, because you did. I, I know. <laughs> Very sorry, Doctor Future, but uh, we. So you are writing a volume right now where new thought has come up pretty significantly, and it's interesting because Seraphiel started getting into this stuff, getting me a little bit in, interested in kind of like the uh, the roots of it and all that, but. You have been independently uncovering a lot of the influence of new thought on what modern day Christianity, and we mentioned briefly in our main section about new thought, where we talked about how Norman Vincent Peale was a huge influence, but there are others. So let's just you know kind of go into what you've been researching about all this. Well, I, I I have to sort of set the record straight there. I really, really haven't been getting into New Thought. Um, Norman Vincent Peale's name came up on the perimeter of some of the influences out on the West Coast of uh, guys like Gerald Hurd, who moved out there in the late 30s and started what was really basically the New Age movement um, and then started the whole LSD experimentation thing with Aldous Huxley. He was the one that got the drugs and stuff to Aldous Huxley to try. Um but some of that influence percolated down. It did get to Norman Vincent Peale and things like that. But what you consider classic new thought, at least as I understand it, is a little bit of a different strain because it doesn't look into the 
chemical assistance. It was more of just pure metaphysics kind of thing. Sure. But isn't there kind of a strain uh, now, like yeah. especially with like prosperity gospel? Right. And John right. Osteen fact, and Joyce Meyer and all this kind of different stuff. Really, it was just a natural progression of the of the Pentecostal charismatic movement, what they call name it and claim it. Uh, because a lot of time in that community, everybody needs a new word, some kind of new thing that's happening. And it became in vogue in the sprite. 70s, maybe earlier than that. Maybe you could take it back to Oral Roberts, but the prosperity gospel teaching was that if you name it, then you can claim it. And you had to visualize yourself, you know, in this kind of scenario, which basically that that all gets intertwined with what they use in multi-level marketing, you know, like the Amways and the other stuff like that. They all use the same material. Now, the, the classic New Thought movement and by the way, a lot of my research, I went when I stopped writing last night and today, I went through and got a book that I had recommended that you all review because basically all I really have to add to you is a book uh, by a host that I had already recommended you all talk to anyway, So, um, which would have gotten you what I had. And that the fellow Mitch Horowitz that wrote Occult America, The, the Secret, have you all... Did you all bother to contact yeah. him or talk to him about New Thought? Because he's the real expert. Not, not okay. yet, but, but, but we, we probably like will I in the told future. You before, yeah. I'm gonna his work is really him. the only real, you know, what I have to offer. And so I just stopped today and, and re-reviewed that information, which, you know, you can hear a lot of that on the uh, Future Quake show that we did with him many years ago, you know, that's still online. So... Um, that's that's basically the main thing that I have to contribute. So, have, have you all looked at his book at all? Either one of you? Oh. No, no, I've not. Well, I've there's, not read there's it. A I have not, but apparently it's a pretty comprehensive yeah, a, review of like all things yeah, occult in America. A whole long chapter, Goes into spiritualism and all that. And then uh, the key players they percolate up on a bunch of other. You know, collateral areas too, because they have their influences that go beyond just New Thought uh, and everybody else. So. Okay. So, it, what is this? I mean, you you've gotten into a little bit of this in the in the books, right? Uh, well, and some like of I the said, influence mostly... on Christianity. Yeah, you know, mostly mine is in a different strain. Mine is more with Gerald Hurd and uh, his work in metaphysics uh, in Southern California when he really got the big business community going in Southern California. The, the head of Southern California Edison and, like, the head of Unical, uh, um, Sun Oil, Sunoco. Uh, those guys all got to, he was their guru, and he was really teaching, you know, metaphysics. He, the one thing, and it, it's pretty much consistent with the most New Age teaching, is they can talk and talk and talk and talk and never really pin them down to anything tangible. Right. And that's one thing that's always been hard for me to take a lot of it very seriously, and it's at least from more of an orthodox thing like a Christian setting that I come from, there are some people that get so mechanistic in it. You know, you get more of like a Calvinistic kind of view. He gets overly mechanistic, and there's just, it's, you know, constrictive. But I like something that has a little bit more of a, a structure where it's more of a um, cause and effect kind of thing that you can build. And when you go down that other line, it's just really hard to hang your hand on anything. And Gerald Hurd was a textbook case of that. He could talk, and he would sound very inspirational, and then you ask him later, well, what exactly did he actually confirm? And people were hard-pressed to do that, but he sure sounded smart. And, you know, if you've ever heard Coast to Coast of George Norrie, you'll hear a bunch of people who sound like that, sound like they're very enlightened, but you really can't really write down in a simple sentence, what did they discover that you can verify? And... uh the New Thought Movement, you know, as I'm sure you all have already covered this, I don't know what you all have covered in your material, w- was really that the divine was inside of you, and that basically you become like a co-creator with the rest of the universe. 
uh, what's going on. You could almost just make a universe of your own finding if you had enough belief in yourself. So it's really more of a faith in self, or whatever they would call a divine spark in yourself. What about uh, what about Christian Science? Well, Christian Science was born out of that. Uh, I don't, have, have you talked much about? Yeah, how uh, Mary Baker Eddy, or who her influence was. Yeah, how she, Phineas Quimby. Yeah. Right, right. Phineas Quimby was. And uh, and then she started, she sort of distanced herself from him. She wasn't really faithful to him, even though he tried to help her, um, you know, become, you know, who she was and be healed. And then he, she said it was a lot of hooey because, is my understanding, Phineas Quimby um wanted to still keep it open for new people to experiment, and he sort of kept it open-ended on the overall yeah. ideology or things like that, and she wanted to really cement it down. I think keep one foot in a pseudo-Orthodox Christian world, even though she would, he would never really call her Orthodox, but I think she wanted to at least pretend she was partially that way, so she wanted more of a fixed dogma Yeah, and didn't want, didn't want to stick with that. But, of course, Quimby, you know, he was affected by people who came before him, like, um, I guess that would be uh, Andrew Jackson Davis. I don't know if you've spoken much about him. We really kind of started with Quimby and Quimby's influence from mesmerism. Yeah, yeah. Well, in between mesmerism, I think if you want to go back to the ground state in the West, in America, the the, the two things from the 1700s that sort of set the stage for all this was one was mesmerism and the other one was... Uh, uh, Swedenborgianism. Yeah, and we touched on Swedenborgianism a little bit. How do you, yeah. how do you see Swedenborgianism as really being a pivotal influence in this? Well, uh, they both cite the works. In fact, um, um, Andrew Jackson Davis, uh, basically his little, I guess you'd call it an astral projection now that he claimed in the 1840s that he did, uh, he actually met with Swedenborg. And a lot of his writing and books, and many books he wrote, that which affected Quimby, that's what Quimby worked from, was from Davis, um, were almost sort of a verbatim cosmology of what Swedenborg showed. And and you could really think of, you know, as the two legs uh, of the, the New Thought Movement or the New Age Movement between these two, because Swedenborgianism comes up with a metaphysical paranormal world and an order to it and who are the prophets that come in and then mesmerism is where supposedly science taps in where you actually have a way for the average person to tap into that world right now they didn't work together they had no reason it's sort of a shotgun wedding neither one of them really were trying mesmer was i don't think he even really tried to specify specifically what he was tapping into that just that what there was something in there that was helping people and and Swedenborg was like a full blown mystic, you know. He he wouldn't even care about the body per se. But those two things basically people packaged together. Where one, it was a belief that was an alternative cosmology description for what we would consider Judeo Christian, you know, order to the to the higher orders. And then mesmerism provided a way where they could experiment and try to come up with a plausible way where somehow it wasn't just a thought experiment like the Gnostics. Right. Because a lot of the Swedenborgian strain would have been very Gnostic in that they would have thought the whole physical body was, was you know, negative, and it was just, it was an illusion, and that it really wasn't even any kind of portal. You just had to basically denounce it. Whereas the scientific side said it can be a portal by which to get into something of which they didn't define. So I think one of the real spins of, particularly in the West, was marrying those two. Because it seems like uh, Westerners are by nature experimenters, and they're very democratized. They just don't want to hear about what some mystic said right. and marvel over what he says. They want to be able to get in there themselves. And New Thought was really packaged for public consumption. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, until like the Kabbalion, it was... In really simple terms, they were they, yeah. they were distilling all these occult ideas. Right. Making well, very it's accessible. funny. Each generation took a different approach of what they got out of it, because by my understanding, the guy who used Quimby's analysis of about this defining your reality by what you view yourself, 
which you know, he still had, Quimby hadn't put in a whole lot of finite details on it. But you had a guy like Wallace Waddles. I don't know if you've talked yeah, much that's about the him. The science of getting rich. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, he was an enigma because he had two sides. One side was the, the, the natural in the, the progression of new thought. Um, it found that it resonated with the world in which new opportunities were happening of wealth building. Yes. And there were new ways through, you know, advanced capitalism and stuff like that where people could make make their own fortune, but they just needed motivation and the ability to work 24-7 and be totally consumed by their agenda. And new thought gave them that opportunity to do that. And so you had some of these guys that were really more mystical and denouncing material possessions and pursuits, but yet they found that it worked dynamite to do it, at least motivating people. And so uh, um, Waddles was a guy who, while he would denounce a lot of it, he, he did it not so much for personal gain like some of the other ones. He did it because he was really a socialist. And, in fact, I think he even ran as a socialist at various times, worked with Eugene Debs, and uh, he wanted to help what was known as the uh, uh, Christian um, social gospel movement. And so he wanted to really help, you know, help the lives of the average people, particularly the downtrodden, through the through that. And, and a lot of the social gospel people, which for which they were, you know, they brought an alignment on themselves that was unnecessary is because they really deviated from a lot of Orthodox Christian teaching, or they allowed it uh, because they got so involved in helping socially with people, which I applaud them for, but they didn't have to throw out Orthodox teaching to do it. And so that that made them open to criticism that was unnecessary. And so they would go toward a guy like Waddles that had a very unorthodox teaching that you really couldn't put any kind of history on or justification to or legacy to. Um, and, and he's wanting to help them with that, but at the same time, he sort of feels unattached to the material world. In fact, his writing, and sometimes he would say totally detached. He, he even told people, don't even think about the problems of the day, you know, because you know what they believe is you think about it and you make it worse. It's sort of a weird thing when you think about new thought. If you think about the problems of the world to fix it, you just make the problems worse because your thinking somehow empowers it to be bad. And that's where things get a little bit ridiculous with new thought. Yeah, it's like you can't even think. It, it, it's it's almost a, the absurdity that you see with things like uh, is it Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, where yeah. if you go to try to look to see where an electron is, you automatically move it where it's not there. Which which drives you know somebody deterministic like in the West crazy because it's like well of course we want to see it so we understand it. Well, if you see it, that by nature changes it. Right, and since since the psychedelic era, they've been trying to uh, you, trying to say that that modern science, and in particular all this yeah. physics theory, somehow justifies and proves hermeticism right. That's like right. kind of a new newer take on it. Which is funny to me because I could argue that the new findings in quantum physics and string theory actually can prove a version of orthodox Christianity but maybe not in the way that a lot of the Orthodox Christians even bother to think. Because, you know, ever since the um, uh, Monkey Scopes trial, they have become so anti-science, at least a lot of them. I'm talking about the more fundamentalist trait. Yeah. Have become so much that way that a lot of times the, the things that could embolden their arguments, they turn away from because of their paranoia. When actually it would help them. Uh, if, uh, I'll just give you one case in point to throw out there. Uh, what we were just talking about with the uncertainty of electron placement, or that it, electrons can be in more than one place at once, or they have what people call it alternate realities, where they can be in multiple places or alternatively justifiable. That would be verboten to, let's say, um, uh, oh, who's the British physicist? Newton. Newton. You know, very deterministic Newton, that that would be impossible because the mathematical. He was an alchemist and a hermeticist, by the way, well, tying it back in all together. That's true, but yet he still <laughs> hung his hat on Newtonian laws. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that, that the universe was a watch that was wound up. And so, but what you find is we now know, now know that electrons could be multiple places and that the laws 
and the mathematical formulas of science can justify both of them or multiple ones. And I look at that and see, for I'll just give you a case in point. Let's say, remember Jesus, would he might see a uh, someone who had leprosy, and he'd see they'd have those leprous cells on them. Well, because he had the authority over the atoms and the subatomic particles that he had created, he had the authority to put them in another alignment that made it whole. So it didn't have to be something against the laws of science. It, he just had the authority and the knowledge to be able to exploit an alternative assembly. And that's why he would not be a lawbreaker. Well, Jesus was not yeah. even a lawbreaker, not of the Mosaic Law, but even the laws of science, because he had a mastery over them, having been overseeing their, their setup, that he knew alternatives that were plausible for wholeness. Right, and and the and the so healing, in, yeah, the healing, in par- the healing in particular is where Christian Science and New Thought uh, take from Jesus. They don't actually; they're not actually Christians, but they still use the name in the churches because right. they're they're thinking that they are a part of this tradition of healing that Jesus used. Well, they think it imparts some legitimacy to their movement, and I'm sure it gives right. them, you know, credibility. They're accepted in the society if they hang that name out there. Yeah, I'm sure it's easier problem, to propagate with that. Yeah, and, and but the problem is they don't actually invoke the person whose name they're using. Uh, they don't go to the empowerment. They see the power isolated within themselves. And the sadness of it is that many Christians don't understand that they are being, if they take their scriptures literally and carefully, that they're actually being trained to d- develop in time a m- measure of independence. But now is not that time for that independence. Uh, it says that the whole creation is groaning and waiting for the appearance of the sons of God. And there will be a sense of, you know, the best way I could describe it is like a Justice League or Avengers or whatever, that God is making into transform humanity once their bodies and everything else are glorified and their minds have been transformed. And so I think there is an aut- autonomy of those abilities. In fact, Jesus even gave the apostles after he resurrected, it says he breathed on them the Holy Spirit and gave them the authority to forgive sins, which is a pretty heavy responsibility. I mean, that's a bit more important than healing people, is the ability to forgive sins. In fact, he said when the the man on the mat was laid down through the roof, and they were all murmuring, and he, he told them, you know, your faith to save you, get up and walk. And the Pharisees said, well, how can he do something like that? And he said, well, he, first of all, he said, your sins are made whole. Excuse me, your sins are forgiven. And they didn't believe somebody could just forgive sins like that other than God. And he says, well, I'll show you you could forgive sins. Take up your mat and walk, which he did, which basically uh, he's shown over and over again that the ability to forgive sins trumps the ability to heal. But the point I'm saying is that there was an autonomy that is the end point for mankind once he buys into the right thinking to do good, the way the universe is ordered. But doing it now is preemptive, because you still have, if they're like me, they still got their head all messed up. And they, they haven't really bought in necessarily what is good or what is not selfish. or you know. And that's part of the problem with the New Thought Movement, is that they tried to tap into some of that, but they still had a lot of selfishness in a lot of people. And that's why they went to the business magazines and stuff like that and started think and grow rich. It, it seems to me that there's a certain amount of corruption involved with some of this stuff of just, you know, this, this whole idea of like, it, it's just all about material things and, and the, the, the material world. And that, you know, the, there's that justification we were talking about earlier where they say, well, like, you know, you got to get rich because if you don't get rich, then you can't, you know, you can't You're be, you can't be spiritual. And I think that that right. is something that is, that has come into Christianity now. And oh, I think yeah. that really drives, and we were talking about this earlier about how it really drives the whole fascination with Trump, you know, that they, I, you mm-hmm. know, I think, I, I don't think it's just that like he's the imperfect man that's going to save, save the world that God uses, you know, he's going to, uh, this whole idea. I think that they really see that, you know, that the, the, this they is, the, him, this is the pair to them. He's yeah. the paragon of, yeah. of Christianity that is filtered through the, through this whole new thought movement. And that's why that's why he basically serves as a mirror, because he shows them what they want to be. 
And that's why you have a guy like Jerry Falwell Jr., whose dad, yeah. you know, was the paragon of trying to get puritanical living back in society. His big thing he had to say about Trump when he went to see him was how big his plane was, how impressed he was with his, uh, yep. his, his, you know, jumbo jet that he had. That was the main thing that impressed him about it. And I don't think that's what Jesus really had in mind. Was 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 the thing that our our top Christian leaders were supposed to be really impressed by, were by great big airplanes and things like that. Well, it seems like there's a, there's this point where this this whole almost secular new thought comes in, but then it somehow becomes this justification for these guys like Falwell Jr. as you as you mentioned and also what is it jan and paul crouch you know the mm-hmm. guys that, that, that you know they have their own private jet people like creflo dollar who like th- th- has the most obvious last name right. <laughs> you know well, the, I mean, they'll, these they'll people late as they just tell the audience i want a new jumbo jet i don't need it but i want it yeah and i want you to give it to me yeah and the power of suggestion is there and, and if the people enough people don't buy into it, then they get more insidious and say, "Well, if you give this to me, this is a step of faith that you're going to get something." Yeah, because it. I cannot. You're going to get a cut. The, and they say these things that come straight out of the New Thought movement, such as like, "I mm-hmm. cannot serve you well. I cannot serve my flock. I cannot serve the Lord. I cannot serve right. you well unless I have this private jet." Unless I have all this money, if I don't have this money, I cannot serve you, and I cannot serve the Lord, and that's how they justify it. And, and well, and got... many times they don't even bother justifying it. I, mean, I, I have heard it frequently said, "Well, I deserve it because I'm a child of the King," and that's the way children of the King live, and just to hoops and applause and hollering. Now, that wasn't even a, a lame attempt to try to justify I need this for ministry. This was just. Uh, the fact that I am a high hump idiom, and so they get yeah. the, what you know the Bible calls the widow's might. You know, the the poor people on fixed income and stuff like that, and then their dollars because, if it, and and basically what what uh, Jesus said, he says it'd be better if you just sort of had a millstone tied around your neck thrown in the sea. You would you, you would come off better than what's going to happen to you after this life for doing that kind of stuff. Those people are definitely uh, have earned a woe, a you know, W O E woe uh, that's coming upon them, because yeah, that's the worst of the worst. And the other irony is, is that if they ever listen to what the, the repeated teachings of the kingdom Jesus taught, you cannot act rich, rich and get in the kingdom. You have to act poor to get a chance. It's not like this world, where you have to you know you think about a lot of industries like selling real estate. Where people say you got to get a nicer car to drive, and you have to have a fancy car, so they think you're success, and success breeds success. And you got to dress for success. The opposite is true in the kingdom of heaven. But, you really have to come off as a nobody, and so what happens is they are really sort of tying a noose around their own neck because they're going to stick out like a sore thumb, you know, in the kingdom of heaven. Like like the person who didn't show up to the to the bride to the wedding with the bride clothes, they're going to be completely overdressed in a gaudy way and stick out and uh, find themselves on the outside. Well, let's mention here, too, you mentioned this earlier about multi-level marketing and about yeah. Amway. And, I mean, Amway is the is a, is a quote-unquote Christian organization, right? Yeah. Let's I mean, put quotes I mean, around that, would you? Yeah. Just uh, air quotes. I, that's, what, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Quote-unquote yeah. Christian organization. Right. And you know it's Amway, the you know the the, the what is it the the DeVos Fortune, you know the, the yeah. current Secretary really, of Education. To, to be yeah. further specific, from what I've learned, you almost need to say in a way, even though they would never advertise this as a such, it's really a reformed Calvinist worldview, because they come from the west coast of Michigan, up around Grand Rapids, Holland, Michigan. It's Dutch Calvinist. Of which they are basically the that family, the DeVos and the princes from Eric Prince, and now they're intermarried. Their royal families married together. They come from the Dutch Calvinist Reformed view that believe in the Protestant work ethic, 
Um, they believe accumulation of wealth is a good thing, and that's partly one of the things that that Reformation, quote, gave to us as their supposed improvement of Christianity, was an accumulation of wealth and capital was somehow virtuous. Yeah. But but I think the new thought stuff has an influence there, too. Oh, well, it's definitely. In fact, I'll, I'll, uh, it's the same thing. They, they have the same net effect on the average person that the uh, prosperity gospel is. If you fail in it, it could never be the fault of their teaching. It's because you gave up just a little bit too soon. If you had followed up and the people, and you see, this is why this fits so good in a Calvinist reform yes, worldview, yes. because you're not an elect. Predestined. You just showed you're not elect because you fumbled the ball before you get across the finish line. And it's, I was talking earlier about how a lot of the, that in those aspects of new thought are, uh, there's a lot of Hindu influence in that, in the mm-hmm. caste system, in that the caste system is, right. is spiritually ordained. Well, and, and not just to count on them, look at the British system. The British caste system is that way. Uh, and, in fact, if you go back even further than that, any kind of more conservative ideological view, which in old times would have been called royalist or monarchist or even just conservative uh, traditionalist, they all believed in a rigid social structure of the noblemen, you know, they really get into peerage and royalty and that these people are born into this and a structure itself. Now, in in America, you don't have official peerage and royalty and stuff like that, so they have to figure out some other way to justify the haves and the have-nots. And so they come up with this form of spiritual meritocracy that, you know, that uh, you know, money and other things shout a favor on said, you're made of better stuff than the other people around you that aren't. And and there is something to be said, people who stay dedicated, that, you know, invest in their education or invest in other things they do, other stuff. I mean, it is a cause and effect that you get better. And it's hard to, accomplish, have, hard to for, accomplish great things without a positive attitude. Right, and that's true, too. So you see, and that's the insidious thing about all these kind of things. There's always merits of truth to all these things. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say it's even easier to prove, more more than everything good happens to you because you're good, it's much easier to prove that there's bad happen, things that happen to you if you're always in a bad attitude or depressed or always look at a bad thing of everything in the world. You know, that because it'll affect your health. It'll affect your mental health, but it affects your physical health, too. And any doctor will confirm that, that if you do those kind of things, they do become self-fulfilling prophecies. Certainly in our relationships, if you are highly, highly skeptical of everybody you come across, you will end up sabotaging your relationships with other people. You know, I don't know how many people have gone through dating with people and found people who have had a bad, you know, past or something happened, and they end up just recreating it again because they anticipate it. So we know in a practical sense that cause and effect happens, but they elevate it to some kind of pseudo-mystical religion because that's what they have to do to sell it. Otherwise, they would just say, well, that's common sense. And how are you going to sell a book on just saying it's common sense? <laughs> so you've got you to dress it up to where you call it something like the secret because if it wasn't a secret, then you couldn't sell anything. Well, I think that that's a, uh, I think that's a good place to stop it, Dr. Future. I want to thank you so much for coming on and well, talking about this. It is a good thing to have good thoughts, and it's a good thing to have new thoughts. It's just when people try to put, like, a little trademark symbol on it and think that they have something there, you have to look behind the curtain and say, you know, is it just the Wizard of Oz and flames going up and there's a man talking and a speaker behind it? Or is there is there meat on it? You know, it's like Clara Peller says, Where, "Where's the beef?" <laughs> you may awesome. have already talked about Clara Peller today. I didn't mean to yeah, yeah, that. I didn't know that that great philosopher Clara Peller was going to come up. Yeah. I, I, that, that great the that great new thought philosopher of Clara Peller. Right. right. All right. Now, you know, every new religion needs a Clara Peller chase them around, <laughs> ask them where the beef is, and that's what we need to do: is ask everybody where the and then we don't care who they are. Who they care what they are? If you don't see beef, move on. If they just give you bun, you know. 
I know one lady I, I knew, uh, her and her husband, they were newly married, and they had finally fixed their first cookout meal, and she was telling him how much she enjoyed the hamburger. She thought it was the best one she'd ever had. And, you know, it was fully dressed and everything on it. She looked at it and realized there was no hamburger on the bun. She had just been eating all of the, the dressings and everything else on it, but she convinced herself that it was the best hamburger she ever had. And I'm afraid in a lot of our lives we do that a lot of times. So we we need to be Clara Pellers ourselves. You know? Yeah, we need to now, ask where be the beef is. Downer, but that you, it's, you, what you have to do is sometimes you have to be skeptical like that so then you can find what is good and then celebrate what's good. Yeah. All right, Dr. Future, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to close the show here now. I think this is a good a good exploration of new thought yeah. what do you think sir yeah, absolutely i'm happy with it all right well hey guys i suggest you look into ernest holmes i don't know if y'all do y'all talk much about him i think i got his name written down here somewhere i don't i don't he, recall if he's he went probably over the most successful i mean a, 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 apart from uh pop psychology like uh norman vincent peel and think and grow rich you know napoleon hill and these guys that did more in like the business inspirational area Ernest Holmes actually started what you could call a church denomination, a church of religious science. Yes. And yes. they had probably, they estimate, 100,000 members around the country. Uh, started all sorts of big, massive churches around the country. And he was the biggest influence on Norman Vincent Peale, although he tried to keep it quiet. In one interview in 1987, Norman Vincent Peale spilled the beans and said that basically he took... Ernest Holmes shtick, basically. Wow. All right. So, well, if people want to contribute to our new thought revolution, where can they go, Sergio? They can go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal or make a one time donation at conspiranormal.com. And we're going to imagine that money coming in and we're going to make it manifest. I see it already here. I see a brand new yeah. studio. I'd just like to see some faith promises my way sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. Uh we'll be back n uh, in a few days. We're gonna have we're gonna be back with Aaron Gullius. Uh we're gonna talk about some more stuff from his saucer life. This is just a nice little interlude to our romper room for the month. Next month's romper room will be on Patreon as we are doing one of these every other month on Patreon. I want to thank Dr. Future for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Future. Hey, thank you. All right, stay on the line. And guys, we'll be back next week on Conspiranormal. Think new thoughts. Thoughts are things. <laughs>